Hi, I'm Paul J. Welcome to the analysis.news. Uh, please don't forget the donate button, subscribe, hit that little bell if you're on YouTube so you get the alerts. Uh, most importantly, come on over to the uh, website and sign up on the email list. We'll be back in just a few seconds to discuss the current situation in Haiti. In March, hundreds of thousands of Haitians took to the streets of Port-au-Prince to demand an end to corruption and the departure of President Giovino Moise, whose term of office had expired. Moise was refusing to call new elections and was essentially establishing his own one-man authoritarian rule. Well, on July 7th, people got what they wished for, but perhaps not how they expected, or even in a way they would have approved of, Moise was assassinated in a plot that so far seems so convoluted that it's hard to believe the official or unofficial versions of what took place. After decades of Duvalier dictatorships, a coup against the elected president Aristide, natural disasters, cholera introduced by UN supposed peacekeepers, and until now the dictatorship of President Moise, the hands of the United States and Canada have been ever present. One thing for sure, once again, it will be the Haitian people that suffer from the consequences of the chaos following Moise's murder. Now joining us to discuss the current situation in Haiti is Jafric Aiti, or Jean as he's known to his friends. He's an author, a radio show host, a public speaker, activist, artist, Canadian civil servant, and he works with the Canada Haitian Action Network and the Haiti Quebec Solidaire. Thanks very much for joining us, Jean. Thank you, Paul. So obviously you, one has to have a basic understanding of the historical context of Haiti uh, in terms of the, the, the slave rebellion the, and the declaration of an independent state by the slaves and then constant foreign attacks and foreign intervention and, and so on. And we can get into more of that, but we have discussed it before and I'm sure mo much of our audience or most know some of the basics of, of the context. But before we get into some of the more bigger picture political uh, issues here, uh, what the hell's going on? What do we know of what happened? Well, there are certain things we know. I mean, we know that there was assassination of Jovenel Moise um, without the party in power uh, falling. Uh, so there wasn't an immediate... Uh, you know, like when you have a military coup in Haiti, uh, there's someone who automatically claims that they're going to be the president. This, what's happening now is a very weird situation where the uh, sitting um, prime minister is someone who was fired by Moise a couple of days before the assassination. Yet he's the one who is acting prime minister because the, the person who was named by Moise had not sworn in um, and named his cabinet. And the reason he wasn't sworn in is because there's nobody to swear him in. I mean, most of this, most of the, the Senate and the, certainly the Assembly, there's nobody there, right? Well, exactly, because the, the, the essence of the foreign occupation that started uh, February 29, 2004 with the coup is a complete dismantlement of the Haitian state. Uh, and once they establish the puppet um, governance, uh, first of Michel Martelly and then uh, of Jovenel Moïse, essentially these guys seem to have gone out of their way to destroy every semblance of a state in the country not organizing elections for the legislature. Like you mentioned, there are only uh, 10 senators and you'd be hard pressed to find one of them who doesn't have ac accusations of drug running, um, kidnapping, murder on them. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's not, we don't even have 10 senators, uh, okay? So this is something that's happening while Haiti is supposedly benefiting from a UN uh, mission uh, since 2004, whose job is to help the Haitian institutions and stabilize the country. Uh, so it's uh, a, a complete reversal. And if you just take stats to look at it, at the eve of the arrival of the foreign troops in Haiti in 2004, 
there were 7,000 elected officials. Today, there's not a single person who was elected who is sitting in office. Not one. Because the prime minister in Haiti is not an elected uh, office. It's someone who is appointed by the president. Okay? And so on top of that, you have two people claiming to be prime minister. Uh, both of them were named illegally. One of them was actually fired. Yet he's the one that the United Nations are talking to as the person running the country. The reality, Paul, is that the population of Haiti has never relied on these fools who are selected by Washington to do anything for them. So, and, and that's another thing that maybe those who organized this whole thing were counting on some kind of civil unrest and things like that. People just stay home. Uh, because they realize they don't have any control on what's happening here, and what's happening there is not their doing. Is this a situation where the Haitian elites, the, you know, the handful of very rich families who work with the foreign corporations, mining companies, and such, created a kind of a monster that they lost control of? And you know, this is really a contradiction amongst the elites that this is, this guy. You know, we've seen this before. It happened with Noriega in Panama. Uh, to some extent, you could even say it happened with Hitler in Germany, where you create these elites, create these monsters, and then they lose control of them. Yes, and and I would say it's it's definitely several monsters, and the monsters create sub monsters <laughs> to whom they subcontract. And 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 uh, in the case of Moise, all of the uh, things that are coming out right now point to. Um, people within his party who have considered him to have become a liability uh, for the upcoming elections. And uh, there are some very significant things that happened um, in the week leading to the assassination that people should pay attention to. First, there are a set of uh, massacres that took place uh, where uh, two young journalists aged 33 were killed who were uh, known to be critical of uh, the regime, the PHTK regime. Uh, one of them, a very uh, known, well-known uh, feminist activist uh, uh, who really um, was very present, uh, had a very uh, uh, strong presence on social media and everything. And um, the same evening they were gone down, um, a number of other people were killed, and, and it wasn't clear as to what the point was. Um, but it, you know, it may or may not be linked to the assassination that happened right after that. But one thing is that uh, the journalist uh, and, and uh, feminist activist who was gunned down was actually a, a former colleague at the university uh, of um, Claude Joseph. Uh, the the guy sitting as prime minister, and who is also very close to the economic uh, powerhouses uh, who masterminded the 2004 coup. Uh, and you know, at the time, you had a, a few of the rich uh, Haitians uh, of uh, uh, white American origin who financed the coup. Um, one of them, Andre Aped, who's an American citizen, we talked about him. Well, Claude Joseph was uh, his, uh, the, you know, to the guys who are not very friends of him call him uh, Claude, uh, Andre Aped's errand boy. And so he was placed there as prime minister. Okay. So this, the whole team that you have here, the whole PHTK uh, party, Jovenel Moïse came from, and that Michel Martelly before him. Uh, so basically for the past 12 years, they've been running the show. Um, they came from that movement of, uh, uh, of people within uh, the Haitian society who supported the international kidnapping and, uh, and coup against uh, the legitimate government of President Aristide. Hmm. Uh, so, so far, uh, this, these Colombians... Uh, this Haitian businessman who lived in Florida. Uh, wh wh what do you make of all this? I, I mean, the whole thing smells like Bay of Pigs kind of craziness, where in the end you actually had, you know, some more serious people behind it. 
yeah, uh, obviously no one is taking seriously this pastor who was financially broke, yet entered Haiti into a private jet. Uh, like this whole story doesn't compute because to to for the logistics that it takes to move all of these Colombians, uh, this one uh, pastor out of uh, the United States could not have financed that. So obviously uh, there are some people with serious money uh, who financed it. Um, but also the behavior of the Colombians who were not in a rush to leave the country uh, suggests that the idea that uh, Jovenel knew them and that in fact they were hired by Jovenel for repression Against or, or, or or according to one of them, it almost sounded like they thought they were being hired to protect him. Yes, yes, and 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 those duties are usually mixed in Haiti. The people who protect the dictator also repress the population, uh, because that's you know the the dilemma here for uh, the United States, France, Europe, who participated in the coup in two thousand and four was always, how do we remove a popular leader, replace them with unpopular people, but manage to keep them in power? And the only way to do that is to attack the population. Uh, and they did that. They did that very systematically after the coup in 2004. There were numbers of massacres. You know, usually when people talk about the legacy of the UN troops in Haiti, um, you know, cholera is mentioned because they brought cholera there that killed 50,000 Haitians and uh, contaminated over a million. But uh, they also massacred large numbers of people. And, and it's not a coincidence that you had the armies of uh, Brazil, uh, Jordan, like countries that are known for these types of actions who were hired uh, essentially to wipe out the popular support uh, in those neighborhoods that refused to accept the coup and the kidnapping. And so today, what you have is a, a, a power struggle within the set of puppets who have no popularity, who know exactly the only way they can remain in power is to organize rigged elections with the support of their international uh, uh, supporters and backers, but with low turnout elections where they can just go into the computer, put in the numbers, and claim that, well, you know, it wasn't perfect, but for Haiti, we'll have to accept it. I mean, we've seen that kind of uh, uh, fake elections organized, like in the last two rounds. And the way they were planning it this time was to have uh, uh, so-called gangs occupy the most populous parts of Port-au-Prince, because you cannot win an election in Haiti if you don't win the capital city because that's where about 2.5 to 3 million of the population live. Uh, and in uh, communities, impoverished communities like Cité Soleil, I mean, you got to win that. And so what they, they've been doing is systematically placing gangs there. And so if you have gangs there and then you have an election, and, and that's the other thing you observe, the Americans, the Canadians, everybody is insisting that the election has to take place in September. Haitians are saying that, listen, we're not in a rush to organize elections because clearly we're not ready to organize elections. You don't have one single person who's been elected who is legitimate. So who's going to be running that election? But for the Americans and the Canadians, it's just a fig leaf they need because they can't scream about democracy in Latin America and support somebody who won't even call an election. So. Yeah, exactly. And so, and of course... Uh, given that uh, seldom shows like yours where this is being discussed uh, in more detail and depth, people are going to hear the sound bites and they're going to hear that they're supporting elections. Well, that's a good thing <laughs> without understanding. In terms of bigger picture here, we we can let's talk about who who benefits from his assassination. Uh, because uh, I th what isn't being talked about very much in the press, uh, although even in the Washington Post, like today, there's a piece about you must understand that the history of foreign intervention in Haiti has been the problem, not the solution. I mean, they're even talking like that in mainstream press. But there's very little talk about the, the exploitation of Haitian minerals, uh, cheap labor, 
the elites in Haiti and some very rich families. That doesn't get much focus and how why there why there's something at stake here for the Americans and Canadians particularly. It's not surprising to me because um, the pattern of what we're seeing in Haiti does not only happen in Haiti. Uh, that those families that are established as fifth column in Haiti, uh, they are not um, from the Haitian history. These people, their roots are not with the Haitian history, and 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 because race is something that is seldom discussed in talking about imperialism. Um, very few people take the time to analyze what's happening in Haiti from that angle as well. Yeah, let's, let's dig into that a bit, because if I understand it correctly, ironically, in some ways, a lot of these families are actually of Palestinian origin. Am I, am I mixing things up? No, not, not necessarily Palestinian. And that's, that's another problem because, you know, uh, they, they, we use those terms so often in Haiti, people will say Syrian or Syrian, but they are not all Syrians either. Uh, really, it's it's a mix. So if we take it to the history, the revolution did not happen with, you know, a happy family of Africans who were uh, enslaved. They revolted and they chased out the colonizers. It wasn't that simple. The, the, the regime... Uh, the white supremacist regime that was established on the colony had one principle that you could not undo. That is, you cannot enslave a white person. But everybody else was fair game. You could even have a black person enslave a mulatto. It's rare. It probably never even happened. But according to the law, you could. So everybody could partake in the crime of enslavement. And that is one method they use to maintain the system. Because you had 20,000 whites, about 20 to 30,000 mulattoes or mixed race people, or what they call affranchis. But actually among them, there were some Africans also who were anciens libres, people who were freed long time ago from several generations, and who also owned slaves. You had so, some of that in the United States too. Well, yeah, like the whole, and that's why a lot of these guys, when they left, they went to Louisiana because they could continue to be slave owners in Louisiana, even, and, and of course, once they got there, some of them who were very light-skinned tried to pass as white, and there were all kinds of dynamics happening. But the thing is, in every discussion, it's always too difficult to get into these nuances, but they are important to understand what's happening in Haiti today. Because when the revolution took place, the leader of the revolution, Dessalines, was clear that he wanted to establish a new system where the, the racial hierarchy was completely destroyed. Because just like in Brazil, in Haiti, you had different uh, uh, ways of calling people depending on their shades. It wasn't as drastic as Brazil, where I don't know how many different names these uh, fools invented. But in Haiti, uh, you had uh, Quateron, which was someone who was three quarters white. Uh, because they used whiteness as the the the, the unit, uh, you know, the hum human unit. And so if you were uh, three quarters white, you were quateron. If you were half white, you were mulatto. This silence said, the hell with the stupidity. All humans are humans. And that's the basis of the Haitian Revolution. But that lasted only two years because... Uh, the the free the 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 Afranchi, or the blacks who were freed long time ago, uh, and the mulattoes didn't want that. They didn't want people who just not so long ago were their slaves to become their equals. And they certainly did not want to redistribute the land, like Desalines said. Desalines said, "We can no longer deal with the issue of well, I inherit." the land that my French father owned, or my British father, because the British own a quite a large part of the territory as well, because I have papers, but the person who was working on that land all of these years, who doesn't have papers, because Africans could not even have a name, let alone have papers, uh, they suddenly said, no, we did a revolution so that all of this can, we do a restart, and we redistribute the land. So they basically managed to assassinate Dessalines 
and use the same model that was used in the rest of the Latin American countries. You know, people talk about Simon Bolivar and Miranda. These guys were never interested in completely abolishing slavery. What they did was establish a mulatto uh, republic uh, and then, you know, the greater Colombia and all of that and maintain slavery. Yes, they, you know, uh, uh, Bolivar freed his personal slaves, but he did not abolish slavery. You know, so you had slavery in Latin America all the way in Cuba, I believe it was 1888, uh, and, and some of the places a little bit earlier. But the fact is, this system was maintained in Latin America. In Haiti, these guys did a different uh, a trick. Like, they continued to boast about the Haitian Revolution, uh, that Haiti is, is the first black republic, but in reality, they re-enslaved the Africans. Um, they used different terms for it. Um, they said that uh, they were now, because uh, uh, Boyer instituted something called corvée, and then he said that uh, if you're a peasant and you are coming to the city, you have to justify your presence there. So in other words, they just kept the impoverished black masses in the mountains without any resources. Like even the public schools that were established by Desalines, they closed. And then the whole effort from 1807 onward was to gain international, which means white approval. So to get uh, the Vatican to recognize Haiti, which happened in 1860, uh, to get the United States to recognize Haiti, which happened after emancipation in the United States, etc. So in France, they accepted to pay to France the equivalent today of over $40 billion of ransom. Basically, the French said that our uh, colonizers lost their property, which is uh, uh, the slaves, then we have to pay them reparations. So Haiti was feeding the French economy from 1825 to 1947. And the mulattoes who were running the show at the time, they were all very happy with this. Because what, what happened is that the French came back uh, to you know, take control of the economy, and then the mulattoes govern the state. And that was the deal. So the racial hierarchy that was there during the colony came back, except that now in politics, you saw a mulatto face as the president. And when it becomes untenable for them, because the black masses are in the majority and they see what's going on, because there used to be revolts all the time, civil wars, then the next practice is président de doublure where essentially they find some old black general and they put him as the figurehead, the president. And this is the model that you've seen applied uh, throughout uh, the, the, uh, you know, the existence of that so-called first black republic, where racism is still the same model of racism that you see in the United States, that you see in Haiti. So how come a country that made its revolution fighting white supremacy is applying anti-black racism and it, it, it and you can see it in in culture uh the language that the people of haiti speak is not the language of the state uh we you know our language is creole it's not french um officially they will tell you that uh, haiti is a, a a country that doesn't uh, have any religion but that's not true because De Salin did say that in his first constitution in 1805, that the state doesn't, you know, uh, bother people. They practice whatever religion they want. But once they eliminated De Salin, they said, you know, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholicism is the state religion. And the state to this day pays the salaries of the priest in Haiti. And when, when there's an election and there's a new president, there is, a, a, you know, something called a te deum, you know, you know, things that, you know, people have abandoned long ago uh, in, in Europe, but they're still doing those things in Haiti. And so what you have is this fake black republic, this black face republic that was 
maintained throughout these years, and that was well supported by the white power system because that's that does their uh, uh, their trick for them in terms of their interests because all of the economy of Haiti is all controlled and so when the Americans invaded in 1915 um, they put a stop to all of the uh, revolts and the civil wars that were happening and clearly established the the mulattoes uh, as as you know the the people who run the show so you look at the Dominican Republic today. That's exactly how Haiti was under uh, U.S. occupation. Every Haitian president was way lighter than me. Uh, uh, some of them looking white, and and that once and these guys they they finished their terms because the Americans are essentially the ones running the show with these uh, fools, uh, you know, creating a, a republic for themselves where the, all of the privileges are for them and the black masses are uh, maintained, uh, subdued by the military and, and things like that. So it gets a little bit complicated because just before you, uh, the turn of the century, before we get to the 1900s, then you had refugees from the Middle East. Uh, and that's where you have the Syrian uh, or the Lebanese or, 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 or the Jewish uh, Haitians. So, and, and ju during the wars in Europe, you also had Jews who Jewish families who found refuge on both sides in Dominican Republic and in Haiti. Some of them were very impoverished because they were running uh, from uh, unrest in their territories. Um, and at first, you know, they mingled with with the black population, but very quickly they become um, uh, really prime uh, opportunities for the mulattoes who want to maintain whiteness. And so they intermarry with the mulattoes and started to create some kind of a, an apartheid type of an environment for them because, it, of course, it gives them access to uh, the richest people uh, on the island um, because before that, the mulattoes, in order to maintain their whiteness, would be sending their daughters and their sons to marry in Europe and come back with a European. Yeah, because I mean, you, you you're living in a population ninety nine percent black people. Uh, I mean, that's the only way uh, you and and you have families in Haiti that were, you know, descendants of the European slavers who are white to this day. Uh, so they managed to do it uh, over the years that way. But then when the Middle Eastern families uh, came in, then that became a practice um, uh, intermarrying between the mulattoes and then. Of course, as you can imagine, they started to have conflicts among themselves as well, because as the Middle Eastern families become more powerful, they started to compete with the mulattoes. And in one instance, uh, in fact, um, uh, there were about, I think, four Haitian presidents who were assassinated. And one of them, who is a descendant of the first, of Dessalines, um, the National Palace was blown up with him. Uh, and it was the Middle Easterns. That's when they were first asserting uh, that, you know, hey, we, we, we hold power in this place. Uh, and that was a struggle between the Middle Eastern Haitians and the mulattoes. Okay, so now, you know, people use terms like Palestinian, which is really not appropriate because the, most, the two most famous Palestinian Haitians, um, the Izmiri brothers, actually folks who were really loved and are considered national heroes. And, and in fact, they were very hated by the rest of the Middle Eastern uh, 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 folks because contrary to uh, the rest of the group, they mingled with the population, spoke Creole, they did their business in the population. And, and, and really, uh, if you do a bit of, uh, of the history of the campaign of Aristide in 1990, you'll find that Antoine Ismery is actually the guy who financed most of that campaign. And he was hated for that. And uh, eventually, both brothers were gunned down. They were, they were killed. In H hated by the elites. By the elites, exactly. I mean, uh, during the coup, during the first coup against Aristide in 1993. Talk a little bit about, from an economic point of view, what's at stake? for the elites what is the wealth the gdp of haiti where why are people 
you know, it's it's. I know it's it's about cheap labor, but not only. Well, it's it's cheap labor, but it's also uh, about maintaining the money that they've accumulated, uh, uh, doing corruption in in and in all kinds of businesses. So, for instance, I mean, the richest men in the Caribbean, not in Haiti, the richest men in the Caribbean lives in Haiti. Okay, Gilbert Bijou, uh, uh, one of uh, the most famous. Uh, uh, Jewish uh, families in Haiti, Bijou, and he owns his own port, uh, Port Lafito, in the northern parts of Haiti, and he's very close to Martelly. And lo and behold, most of the weapons that have been caught entering Haiti in the last ten years, uh, war-grade weapons, are in Port Lafito, uh, and and um, and so this is. Like it, it's it's multi pronged. So some of these guys do have sweatshops. So uh, cheap labor is an issue for them. So let, if you take the example of Andre Aped, who was involved in uh, the two coups against Aristide, and who is also considered to be the uh, the power behind uh, uh, Claude Joseph, who is acting prime minister right now. Uh, this guy has sweatshops. So you know the cheap labor. Uh, it, it, it is something for them. But others basically uh, made their money running drugs. Uh, so, for instance, Accra was uh, indicted as the guy who had the biggest shipment of cocaine and etc. cetera uh, in Haiti. And, and instead of him getting arrested, Michel Martelly named him ambassador. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, he never actually took office as ambassador, but he was named. There was a, you know, a, a decree uh, that made him ambassador uh, after he was uh, indicted as uh, someone who was involved in uh, drug running. So they have many things that they're trying to protect. They're trying to protect the money that's already been accumulated and monopolies because they divide um, the access to the import-export business among themselves. There's not really industrialist in Haiti. You don't have really anybody who's producing anything anymore. I mean, the, the last time that there were kind of uh, productions were like uh, uh, baseballs and stuff like that, but now it's mostly uh, people who are producing uh, T-shirts and uh, very, very little in terms of uh, production. What about mining? Mining is another territory where uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 positioning because it, it hasn't been exploitation of the mines yet. Uh, I mean, some of it is happening, but it's mostly exploration. And so the exploration that, it's, that has taken place, there was about 10% of the territory that was considered to be rich in minerals, especially gold. Uh, and Canadian mining companies allied to those families have secured, you know, some lands and native Haitians are saying that there are places in the, in the territory that uh, the natives actually cannot go uh, and, and things like that. But you, as far as we know, there hasn't been large scale exploration or exploitation, sorry, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the gold that is there. What we saw, though, is that there was a lot of political pressure to get the Martelly regime and then Jovenel to change the law, the mining law, so that the companies no longer have to submit their proposal to the parliament uh, before they get approval for exploitation. Uh, and so, and, and everybody like Mining Watch in Canada and, and in Haiti, uh, Justice Min said, no, we, you know, because then it will become so easy uh, for the multinational mining companies to just corrupt a minister, uh, and so and then they start exploiting without having any analysis and uh, environmental remediation and all of these things, uh, as we see happen in other countries like Guatemala and the Congo and and even Brazil. Talk about the state of the people's movement. Uh, you know, sometimes when the elites are in such chaos. Uh, it's a it's a moment where you could, in theory, have a breakthrough uh, of a really revolutionary people's movement. But of course, there has to be an organized movement. Is is there? Yes, yes, it is. It is happening. Um, the the most difficult aspect of it has been that 
in order to overthrow the Lavalas government of Jean-Bertrand Aristide, um, they really saw, they did a job on the Lavalas movement. And, and the Lavalas movement was the popular movement in Haiti. And so it became such that many people in the so-called middle class um, became afraid of even associating with Jean-Bertrand Aristide because the white powers made it so evident that if you are Lavalas, you're not going to have a political future in this country because we are going to put the whole weight of the CIA and, and all of us, we're going to gang up on you. And, and, and that message has been understood. Uh, and you will see uh, Haitians who claim to be progressives tiptoe around any time you mention the name Jean-Bertrand Aristide or Lavalas. Not because they have anything that they are pointing against him, really. But it's just that this guy was elected twice and deposed twice. And the last time it was the Americans who entered his house and kidnapped him. And now I think the uh, interesting uh, turn of events that we've just seen where they've established a puppet and they kill that puppet while in office is actually going to play in favor of uh, the popular movement. Because people can see that even if you collaborate <laughs> with the masters in Washington, you may still get killed. Because, I mean, we don't have any evidence that the Americans uh, participated actively in the assassination of the president. But we know that if they didn't give a green light somewhere, it would not have happened. Because this guy is supposed to be the most protected person on the island, even better protected than any of the previous presidents. Yet this, you know, the uh, and and the DA admitted that some of its agents participated in in in, in the action. They claim that the DA is not involved, <laughs> but informants from the DEA participated, but as if, you know, there was ever going to be a time where the DEA itself was going to say that we just killed the president of Haiti, I mean, <laughs> or the CIA or the FBI. Uh, so th what this means is that some of the actions that we saw happen in the last few weeks, I mean, the day after the, the assassination, there was a large regrouping of political parties, including Lavalas, Petit Desalien, uh, everybody, civil society, everybody who is not associated with the ruling party, with uh, Piashtika, signed that agreement. And essentially what they say in there is that they will not accept another puppet. And they even go as far as saying that it's not absolutely essential for Haiti to have a president and that you know you could have a, a, a period of transition and they insist that this transition has to be haitian led haitian design and that it has to be the fruit of a consultation among the population because right now there is no point in pretending that we are following any constitution because even if you want to you cannot apply any even a past constitution cannot save us right now because they have violated all of uh, the opportunities to renew the judiciary, the um, legislature, and, 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 and the presidency. So no one is legal right now. And that's why they're saying this calls for exceptional um, measures. And, and, and I agree with them that one of the clear signal that needs to be sent is that um, there are people who are not corrupt in Haitian society, bringing new faces. And if they bring a, a collective management, as opposed to naming a president, okay, if they, and they're talking about having a council, a small number of people, maybe four, maybe three, I don't know how many, but who are going to take the steps to bring the country back under constitutional order. The Americans, the Canadians, the French don't like this idea because they have invested in the corrupt regime so much 
that they are trying to salvage elements of it. Uh, and um, to me, that's not, that's not uh, viable. Well, Mao Zedong may have been wrong about a bunch of things, but I don't think he was wrong when he said political power comes out of the barrel of a gun. Uh, who, who's got the guns in Haiti? Because it seems to me like there's the army and then there's the gangs. And, you know, where, who, who controls these sets of guns? It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a lot to do with what happens here. Yeah, but actually it's not the army <laughs> and it's not the gangs who are officially known as gangs. It's actually the families, okay? The same guys who have those private ports, in fact, the biggest arsenal of weapons are up the mountains of Pétionville, okay, where the rich live. I mean, of course, you know, they use it for their own protection, but it's more than that. It's those same weapons that are distributed to the gangs. And so it's a very strange thing. A president is assassinated and there are gangs all over the place and they're all quiet. Okay? <laughs> because their leader has been taken down. Okay? And they don't know who the new sheriff in town is and for their weapons to operate, they need ammunition. And people have been saying it all along. It's not rocket science. The ammunitions that are coming to the gangs are not obtained by them ordering it themselves or going out of their little fiefdom because they are all very isolated because the gangs are rivals. So all of these guys receive regular replenishment through those families, those rich families, who have control of the state apparatus, the police and, and, and all of these things. And so right now, because there is internal fighting among those guys, the families are fighting among themselves, as well as the uh, ruling party, which is really a big gang that has, you know, uh, the earing, the, the ears of, 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 the, of the ambassadors and stuff like that and official titles, but they're really a gang. So that's where the weapons are. Now, that's why when people are saying, well, then should the U.S. intervene? Should Canada intervene? They say, well, how about you apply uh, the weapons embargo? Haiti is actually under embargo. And all of these weapons are coming from the United States. It's, it's not complicated. So, no, you don't need to send soldiers. Apply the embargo. Very quickly, these gangs and these families will be without weapons. But, of course, they will never let that happen. And that's why they have the doctrine of the responsibility to protect. And when, when they say that on TV, on CNN, Radio Canada, people don't ask for the rest of the sentence. I say it sounds positive, the responsibility to protect, you know, like when a population is endangered, you know, we as citizens of the world, we have a responsibility to intervene and protect. But protect who? <laughs> it's protect their corrupt allies in those countries. And exactly what um, the analysis that we need to do as people who are fighting for justice and peace in the world is to understand that the neo-colonial system is a direct replica of the colonial system. Under the colonial system, those 20,000 whites had no chance of survival if they didn't have the backing that they know they can count on, the armies of France, Britain, the United States, etc. I mean, that's, that was their real power. Under the neo-colonial system, it's the same thing. Those 15 families in Haiti, no matter how powerful they can be, the contacts they have, if the United States, Canada, and Europe leaves them alone, they won't last. And so that's why they've instituted these responsibility to protect doctrines so that they claim that there is unrest in Haiti and then they're intervening to protect the population. But the last 17 years proved to us that the Haitian population has not been protected. But those 15 families have been protected, not a single casualty among them. So they've been protected. 
All right, I know you have to go, so we're, I'm going to call this part one, <laughs> and uh, and okay, I'm going to well. we're going to we're going to do this again soon, very soon, and keep this going because I, I think this is an excellent uh, beginning for a better understanding of what's going on in Haiti. So thanks very much, John. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for the and, and Thank time. you for joining us on the analysis news, and uh, very soon we'll we'll follow this up with a, with another part. Uh, and again, don't forget the donate button, subscribe, and all the buttons.